Welcome to worship at Northfield United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Rachel McIver Morey, and I am delighted that you are here. Now, whether you're watching via a watch party or watching the video at some other point, I'd like you to take a moment and just mention uh, that you're here in the comments or the chat box as you see them. Did you do it? Excellent. So did I. We're glad you're here. Welcome. Today's prayer was shared by William J. Barber. It was written by Cameron Belm. We take excerpts from that prayer. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. O oh Lord, may we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May those who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May we have the necessary righteous indignation in this moment to fight for transformation. May those who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. May those who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools are closed remember those who have no option. May those who have to cancel our trips remember those who have no place to go. May those who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market remember those who have no margins at all. May those who settle in for a quarantine at home remember those who have no home. May we choose love. During this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us yet find ways to be the loving embrace of God for our neighbors. And let us recognize that we cannot give up in this moment. Lord, we cannot give up in this moment. And we know that you never give up on us. We think about what's going on in our own individual lives as we prepare to share in this coming time of silence. We think about those places where we would see your light, where we would feel your steadfastness. We think about those places and those people who we reach out to with our hearts and ask you to do the same. In this coming silence, Lord, hear what is on our hearts. And in this silence, Lord, speak to our hearts as well. Lord, we thank you for your loving presence with us and with others. We thank you for hearing our prayers and for hearing the prayers of others. And we thank you for all of the ways that you speak to us. We thank you for the prayer that you spoke to your disciples, which we now prepare to say together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
The reading will be from Psalm 136, a psalm of God's work in creation and history. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who spread out the earth on the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who struck Egypt through their firstborn, for his steadfast love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them, for his steadfast love endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who divided the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endures forever. And made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his steadfast love endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who led his people through the wilderness, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who struck down great kings, for his steadfast love endures forever, and killed famous kings, for his steadfast love endures forever. Sion, king of the Amorites, for his steadfast love endures forever, and Og, king of Bashan, for his steadfast love endures forever, and gave their land as a heritage, for his steadfast love endures forever, a heritage to his servant Israel, for his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our lowest state, for his steadfast love endures forever, and rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. O give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. Today's poem is Lack of Steadfastness by Geoffrey Chaucer. We're reading a translation by A.S. Klein. Once this world was so steadfast and so stable that a man's word was his obligation. And now it is so false and mutable that word and deed in their conclusion are unalike, for so turned upside down is all this world by gain and selfishness that all is lost for lack of steadfastness. What makes this world of ours so variable but the pleasure folk take in dissension? Among us now a man is thought unable, unless he can, by some vile collusion, wrong his neighbor or wreak his oppression. What causes this but such willful baseness, that all is lost for lack of steadfastness? Truth is put down, reason is held a fable, virtue has now no domination, pity is exiled, no man is merciful. Through greed, men blind discretion. The world has made such a permutation of right to wrong, truth to fickleness, that all is lost for lack of steadfastness. Envoy to King Richard II. O Prince, desire to be honorable. Cherish your folk and hate extortion. Order that nothing which may prove shameful to your office be done in your kingdom. Show openly your sword of castigation. Dread God, seek law, love truth and worthiness, and wed your folk again to steadfastness. During this Easter season, we've been using psalms and we've been using poetry to try and find fresh language for this strange time we find ourselves in. And so we've been trying to find new questions uh, for a new day. And so today we come to one of my very favorite psalms, which is Psalm 136, which you heard read. Psalm 136 is a psalm that uh, is has been used so much in church music and in other ways. And there's a reason for that. 
half of it is the same line. And depending on the translation you're reading, it might be the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases or uh, his steadfast love, the steadfast love of God endures forever or God's love endures forever, but all of them in that same sort of, uh, same sort of vein. Now, What's interesting to me about this psalm is a lot of things, but I'll stick to just a couple. Uh, The first is that the portion of the story that this psalm tells is very specific and gives us a clue as to the date. Now, we don't know for sure. Like so many of the psalms, we don't know the time of writing, but the history that's recounted in the psalm in betwixt and between those lines of God's love endures forever They are uh, lines telling the story of God saving the people from Egypt, bringing people out of slavery and and injustice into the wilderness under Moses' leadership, and then going one step further into defeating their enemies as they um, start their movement toward the promised land. But the psalm does not actually take the people all the way to the promised land. So this gives us a clue that this psalm might be very, very old indeed because it doesn't have any reference to the reign of David. It doesn't have any reference to the exile like some of the psalms do. This might be a very, very old psalm indeed. Now, we are not sure... I could write a song today about, for example, Genesis 1. That doesn't mean that, you know, it happened in Genesis 1. Mm -hmm. But it gives us a clue and something to work with. So uh, this psalm celebrates God's movement of love in history with God's people, of freedom, of victory, of constant accompaniment. Yeah, so when you think about it, Psalm 136, that's, that's the psalmist's, way of expressing God's steadfast love. If you were going to write Psalm 136, what would you include to express God's steadfast love? I think about uh, a time after I'd recently converted to Christianity, began accepting God and had this sense of relationship with God, and one of the, there was, I had an experience where I really felt the presence of God through the voice of my friends during a time of extreme personal crisis. So for me, Psalm 136 would be, God, your steadfast love endures forever, for I remember where you were uh, that evening at that place when my friends came and said these things they couldn't have known, but I could hear your love present in it. For that reason, I know that your love endures forever. If you were going to write Psalm 136, what would you look back to in your own life that is a reminder of God's love for you? What is in your Psalm 136? It's a wonderful exercise to do this because it really um, helps ground us in gratitude for the fact that God has been active in our stories and it gives us hope for how God has been active in our collective story and life as humanity as well. Uh, So that's a great exercise and we hope that you take that up this week. What is it, what is it, what is it? The steadfast love of God endures forever. So uh, I I hope you do that. Now, let's put it in conversation with our poem today. Speaking of old things, uh, this is uh, an old piece of English literature from Geoffrey Chaucer. And um, uh, it's a piece that uh, if the, when you first hear it, it sort of a, has a kids these days sort of vibe to it. It has this sense of, oh, things used to be good. People used to be as good as their word, but now everything's falling apart all for a lack of steadfastness. So just as the drumbeat for Psalm 136 is the steadfast love of God endures forever, the drumbeat of Chaucer's poem is all for a lack of steadfastness. And there's sort of a wistfulness and a sadness and a generational grief that um, you hear in in this poem. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's stop there for a moment and just name, you know, Any generation would write something like that, potentially, about the subsequent generation. True enough. Uh, True enough, right? 
Chaucer, uh, he was writing these words from this perspective of, oh, people used to have values, gosh darn it, and now they just don't have the same values and this, they don't care about the same things and that's why everything's falling apart. I wonder if you've ever heard anyone say anything like that or heard that sentiment expressed. Um, it's, it's a common generational theme sometimes we see uh, of, uh, of sort of a lament that uh, the folks following us don't share necessarily our values. Now, because that can be such a drumbeat, we should ask a question about it. Really? Because if every single generation thinks the next generation is, <laughs> is, is a valueless group, um, you know, that's sort of a drumbeat in history that, you know, there's this generational tension around uh, what, about how the, how the world works and that sort of thing. So we should just tell Chaucer to maybe take a step back and maybe ourselves take him with a pound or two of salt. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, and uh, one of the reasons for this is the very last stanza of his poem. And it sounds so out of place after you've heard the rest of it, which sounds like this generational lament, um, you know, a handshake used to mean your word and so on and so, on and so forth. I'm sorry, I, I say it in my grandfather's voice. I, that's exactly how I hear this thing. <laughs> um, but anyhow, uh, the last portion of this poem is as a missive to King Richard. And if that doesn't pop you out of this poem, I don't know what else will. So in this poem, it's, uh, it, Chaucer is sort of uh, appealing to the king and saying, oh, you know, uh, obey God uh, and uh, under, uh, it's uh, worship God, obey the law and bring us back to a place of steadfastness. And he's sort of, it's this heartfelt <laughs> sort of p uh, plea to the king to do this. And so I looked up King Richard II who was the king during the time of the writing of this poem and the uh, recipient, so to speak, of, uh, of this last stanza that, is, that Chaucer wrote. So King Richard II, he's kind of an interesting dude. Um, he became king at the ripe old age of 10. Yo. Terrifying. And so at the age of 10, he was in charge of an entire country. And when he came to power, it was not all good. Uh, he came to power at the time where, at the beginning of the Peasants' Revolt in England, and this was, uh, it wasn't a one-time event. There were several sort of uh, uh, moments of revolt within the revolt, so to speak. But he was spirited away to safety um, because he was the king and had to be saved, and there was all this violence around him. He was able to lead his men through the violent mob uh, back to the castle, and so sort of a dramatic moment early on in his kingship. That happened when he was 14 years old. Mm. And so the lesson he took from that moment was that power had to be held on to at all costs and instability was never to be tolerated. And so any further revolts, and there were a few, were put down with viciousness, tyrannical viciousness, and throughout his reign, his circle of advisors became smaller and smaller and smaller. Previous monarchs had made use of other aristocratic roles to sort of govern certain things, but he just kept centralizing and centralizing power and authority because he didn't trust people and he wanted to make sure that everything stayed stable and that this uh, revolt would never sort of happen again. So King Richard didn't have a problem with being steadfast. He was very steadfast. He learned this lesson early on that these were bad things and so they needed to be done away with at all costs and he did that. Ultimately, he was deposed um, because he became a hated monarch because he was seen as so tyrannical, so authoritarian and so on and so forth. But I say all this just to say that um, Chaucer's point in the poem doesn't match what we see in King Richard's life at all. He says it's all gone bad because of a lack of steadfastness. Well, no, King Richard was very steadfast, just not in the things and in the values that we might hope for. Mm. So this is where I want to put these two in conversation because Psalm 136 lifts up and celebrates the love of God as steadfast. But we need to be cautious about things about which we are steadfast. We are not God. We do not know all things. And sometimes, like King Richard, 
we can overlearn lessons and act out of that for much longer than is useful. So there are times when a lack of steadfastness is actually exactly what's called for. That's right. Uh, I read a story this week about a gentleman who, uh, his parents were Italian immigrants. He lived in Chicago. Uh, and he, as a teen, get, ended up getting caught up in a crowd of uh, skinheads, of white supremacists. And he got in because he liked the music. It was a kind of punk music. And eventually he started listening to the words and the words kind of got to him. Uh, and he got so enmeshed in this racist community, he ended up opening a record shop that sold these kinds of records. Now, they also sold other kinds of records in the shop. Uh, so other people would come in, uh, people of different races, people of different ethnicities, they'd come in looking for their music. And as the shop owner, he'd end up having conversations with them. And for him, sometimes these were the first relationships he'd had with people who didn't look like him. And he began to get a different sense of his ideas. Uh, he ended up, he got married and he had a kid and he realized that he didn't want his wife or his kids to be a part of this community that he'd been a part of. He wanted to be a buffer between them. And that made him start to realize that this was actually wrong. It's a life of hatred. It's not right. Uh, this way that he'd grown up, he sold the record shop uh, and he actually started an organization called Life After Hate uh, for people who get caught up in these hate movements to help them get out of hate movements and figure out uh, how to turn their lives around so they aren't caught up by this hatred of the other. And so lack of steadfastness about the wrong things is a virtue. We have a name for it in our faith. We call it repentance. So there are things about which we all need to repent, mm -hmm. um, and there are things about which we should not be steadfast. So today we lift up the good news that God's love is steadfast and cannot be moved. We can't do anything about it. We can't uh, separate ourselves from it. It is steadfast. But for ourselves, if we want to be a reflection of God's steadfast love, we ourselves need to be willing and open to where we might not, where we might not be able to be or should not be able to be uh, steadfast. Um, that it is not a virtue in its own right for we as frail, failing humans. Um, we need to be able to take a look at our lives, at where we think about the world, uh, how we operate in the world, and unlike Richard II, say, you know, maybe that lesson I learned then isn't what's needed now. And to the gentleman you're talking about who... Yeah, Charles Picciolino. Yeah, Charles, uh, who uh, lived this life and then realized he learned some of the wrong lessons. And, I mean, heaven bless him for being able to let go of that. I mean, what a, what a struggle that must have been. So, uh, for us this week, our invitation is to celebrate the steadfast love of God and to ask ourselves what, what, what might we be holding on to steadfastly, which isn't serving anybody and does not reflect the love of God made known in Jesus Christ. Now, if you're like me, and I'm watching this Sunday morning, uh, I'm thinking of people who I think ought to see this. And the truth is, I'm watching with everybody else. <laughs> and so this is for all of us. This isn't for that person you have in mind who just won't see that they're wrong about something. This is for me. And this is for you. This is for all of us participating in worship this morning. And we need to pray, God, what is it in me that I need to let go of. So I'm going to be saying that prayer on Sunday morning. Hope you are too, or whenever you're worshiping with us. And my prayer for you is that you would know the steadfast love of God, whatever it is you are called to let go. Amen. Amen. We pray that the steadfast love of God meets you this week and that you will know the deep truth that indeed it endures forever. Amen. Gonna lay down my burden Down by the riverside Down by the riverside Down by the riverside Gonna lay down my burden Down by the riverside Down 
by the riverside Ain't gonna study war no more 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 Well, I sacrificed my starry crown down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down by the riverside, if only till this building down, by the riverside, down by the riverside. Ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war. Study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more. Well, I can tell you I'll be heaven bound down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down by the riverside. Won't know until they lay me down, down by the riverside, down by the Down by the riverside, down by the riverside